Gaza is imploding and we remain on the brink of another potentially devastating conflict. The words of the UN Special Envoy to the Middle East. This past week has seen even more violence and escalations, with rockets fired from Gaza into Israel and an Israeli airstrike killing three Palestinian children in Gaza. Since the Great March of Return protests began earlier this year, Israeli security forces have killed more than 200 people in Gaza and wounded more than 18,000. So is another full-scale Israeli attack on the Strip inevitable. Joining me to discuss this are Donald McIntyre, former Jerusalem correspondent for The Independent and author of the book Gaza Preparing for Dawn, and Najla Shawa, a Palestinian humanitarian aid worker based in Gaza. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Najla, let me start with you. Do you believe that another war in Gaza is imminent because Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu claims he's trying to avoid one? Uh, unfortunately, the situation uh, in Gaza keeps on uh, becoming complicated more and more uh, by the day. Uh, the fear of the people uh, is, uh, is always uh, to face another uh, uh, large-scale uh, escalation. But uh, we, we must say that um, almost every week uh, we are at a risk of, of such escalation uh, due to the disproportionate uh, reaction of the Israelis at the border, uh, but because there's a lot of uh, um, uh, side uh, talks, uh, hidden discussions that people are not uh, fully or even partly aware of uh, that are in the picture, uh, it, it's just becoming uh, more and more complicated to really okay. even analyze or predict uh, or predict anything. Uh, Don McIntyre, Gaza yet again plagued by violence. Uh, things look like they're escalating. Is this just more depressing bad news out of Gaza as we've seen week in, week out, year in, year out for the last few years? Or is this a tipping point? Well, I, I think, as Najla was saying, it's a very, very fragile and dangerous situation. I mean, I think the most positive thing that one can say about it is that it's, it seems like neither Hamas nor Israel really want a war right now if it can be avoided. Um, and the Egyptians also don't want a war because they're worried that it will play back into North Sinai if it, if it happens. So um, Gazans face this really terribly difficult situation in which, as Najla was saying, you know, one minute you're hearing that there's a positive development, the Qataris have, the Israelis have allowed Qatar to send in some fuel, there seems to be a slight muting of the violence, and then it blows up again. Uh, Najla, on the, on the protests themselves, what is the end game? Is there an end game? Is there an understanding you have out there in Gaza that, uh, as to what's going to happen next from the Palestinian side, from the protesters side? The problem is people are very desperate. Uh, those who go to the border are young people who have, uh, unfortunately, nothing to lose, and they want to do something. They want to do something mm. to change their lives. I mean, we have been for years and years in blockade. We have no answer to anything. Uh, we have been for decades trying to do peace, uh, and there is no answer. And, and again, there are no potential even uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the Israelis call their frequent attacks on Gaza, quote, mowing the lawn. Uh, what kind of strategy is that, if you can even call it a strategy? Well, I think it's right that particularly right-wing commentators and politicians in Israel do did develop this concept, which was an absolutely chilling and, in my view, indefensible one, which was that the way to, quote, pacify Gaza was every few years to go in in huge force, as they did in 2008-9, again in 2012, and again in 2014. And that will somehow keep Gaza quiet. Now, I think even some people in Israel, particularly in the military, are beginning to wake up to the fact that uh, for their own security reasons, as much as anything else, that may not be the best strategy. But then, on the other hand, Israel is coming up and facing an election where there's a lot of right-wing pressure to, to mow the grass again. And one can only hope that that pressure is resisted. Um, Najla, isn't part of the problem, though, for the people of Gaza uh, that the leadership and the political uh, conditions on the ground in Gaza are so dire right now. It allows the Israelis to say the problems in Gaza are not caused by us. They're caused by misrule. They're caused by Hamas. 
they're caused by corruption. Uh, it's nothing to do with us. If Gaza was a liberal democracy, everything would be fine, but it's all Hamas's fault. Of course, I mean, that's uh, part of the complication of, of, the, of the picture here is the Palestinian divide, and we know that for a fact. And it is harming the people of Gaza and Palestinians in general and the Palestinian cause. So, uh, yes, inside there are no troops, but Israel controls everything. Uh, the, the people cannot simply leave. They cannot have their uh, he basic health needs. And that's not uh, because of Hamas. Uh, that's because of Israel. Now, of course, taking it to the, the next level between Hamas and Fatah, that's a big problem. And the Palestinians are fed up. But, Najla, you're right to say that it's not the fault of Hamas that there's a lack of health care or, or, the, or the blockade. <laughs> but on the other hand, Human Rights Watch has a report out recently which pointed out that both in the West Bank and in Gaza, um, the Palestinian factions, Hamas and the PA, have been carrying out abuse, torture, um, deprivation of rights. How do people in Gaza feel about the fact that they've got the Israelis oppressing them from outside and in many ways they've got Hamas oppressing them from inside? Yeah, unfortunately, no one can deny that. And unfortunately, nobody is surprised by uh, such, uh, such findings of, uh, of such reports. By both sides, we all realize uh, that both uh, are not being accountable to their people, and they are not, uh, okay. they're not helping uh, as, as they should be. And these violations are being fighted against by the civil society in both areas, but there is a lot, a lot uh, of, uh, of resistance uh, from these factions. Uh, absolutely, and it's all political. Uh, Don, the Israelis always say that all the problems in Gaza are the fault of Hamas, and, which is obviously absurd. But in your experience, in your view, you were in Gaza very recently, you've written this book about Gaza. How much has Hamas made things worse on the ground in Gaza? I don't just mean in material terms, but I mean their very presence uh, and the way they run the place has provided the international community with an excuse to maybe look away and say, well, you know, the, the classic Donald Trump formula, both sides are to blame here. Yes, well, look, you know, there's no doubt, as Najla was saying, you mentioned the Human Rights Watch report. I have some stuff in my book about Hamas behaving at times pretty repressively, and there's no question of that. Yeah. And, and, you know, they're not a cuddly organization in yeah. that sense. However, after they won elections in 2006, which were attested by all international observers to be uh, free and fair elections. That, it seems to me, should have been, the t seems to me, and I should say an increasing number of diplomats who were involved at the time, say so privately now, should have engaged with Hamas. And that was a terrible mistake. Rather than cut uh, them off, rather than cut them do a coup, off, because of and course, then bring in a blockade. Precisely. Uh, just on the US role, Donald Trump, Jared Kushner, are best buddies with Netanyahu and co. Surely, sadly, there can't be any hope for Gaza or the situation on the ground while Trump is in office basically giving an American green light to anything that Netanyahu wants to do. We know that if there is another full-scale war in Gaza, the Americans aren't going to lift a finger. Not that they did before, but definitely not now. No, I think that's right, if there's a war. I mean, actually, there are rather conflicting signals on Gaza coming out of the administration. I mean, on the one hand, we keep hearing rather tantalizingly that Kushner and Greenblatt are working on some kind of rehabilitation plan for Gaza, uh, very much half the story was what's needed, but that President Abbas is against this because he doesn't want a separate deal between the international community and Israel on the one hand and Hamas on the other. Against that, what what Trump is actually doing practically is cutting aid to the Palestinians by an unprecedented amount, and in particular, in an effort to take the refugee issue off the table, is uh, cutting aid, all the aid, to UNRWA. And that's disastrous, or potentially disastrous, in a place where over half the population are, in fact, refugees. Um Najla, we focus a lot on the role of the Americans and the West uh, in backing Israel. But what about your Arab neighbors? What about Egypt, which has helped Israel enforce uh, this blockade of Gaza? Or the UAE, which this week hosted Israeli minister Miri Regev. Um, do you feel abandoned by your Arab neighbors? Uh, absolutely. I feel abandoned. But you know what? I also feel uh, that finally this is the reality, that we have to see it and we have to face it. Uh, Egypt uh, and the closure of the border, the way how they treat people at the, at the Rafah border is, is extremely inhumane and it's extremely unnecessary even. Uh, the, the situation with, uh, I mean, Egypt's involvement in, in uh, resolving is, uh, of course, out of their political interest. Uh, 
and and they must be part of this uh, part of any deal um, and and so no I mean we are not considering this part of the uh, Arab uh, solidarity if you will uh, so this is has this has been uh, changing uh, dramatically and, and Dajla for the people of Gaza what is the priority is it struggling to survive on a daily basis or is there still a sense of ending the occupation <laughs> two-state solution peace process what are the priorities right now for people on the ground do you think um, you know, the problem uh, now is that, yes, there are the daily challenges, of course, and it's affecting more and more, pe more people than ever. Uh, so the majority are busy with really securing their daily basic, uh, basic needs. But in the bigger picture, even if you want to speak to people who, have, who are suffering on a daily basis, uh, and they maybe have the ability to think a little bit about the bigger picture, they don't have any trust in any solution. I think what uh, what now people are, uh, are, are really uh, caring, uh, fe okay. fearing is uh, another political sol uh, solution uh, that can uh, completely ignore uh, the rights again of the people more than before more than previous uh, even previous peace agreements that's what people realistically expect that more denial of their rights and Don last question to you you've written this book on Gaza you spent time in Gaza you've reported from Gaza do you think people in the West even in government not just members of the public recognize how dire the situation on the ground is in Gaza and has been for many years? No, I don't. And I think one of the tragedies of Gaza actually is that if there's a war, then huge attention sw swings onto Gaza. You know, it becomes a big media story even when there are other things going on in the world. And then as soon as that war is over, it dies, you know, as a story. The suffering doesn't and, stop. And the suffering doesn't stop. And also the factors that are leading up to the next war are, are very widely ignored by the media. And I think that's a huge problem. Don McIntyre, Najla Shawa, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me on the show. Up front, we'll be back next week.